so good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thanks for joining our, us for the first uh, meeting of the uh, Fundamentals of Orthopedics Group. Um, we're going to be um, have it, learn a lot from uh, Mr. Bates today. Um, uh, I'll be moder moderating today. Uh, my name's Sebastian, I'm with the Orthopedic Registrars here. Uh, a couple of groundkeeping rules um, to begin with. Um, if we can have everyone with their mics off and cameras off as well. Um, throughout the session, if you have any questions, just post it in the chat box. And uh, during the course of this talk, there'll be intervals where Mr. Bates will be happy to answer some of these questions. All right. I'll first I'll hand over to Mr. Jay Seelan, who's going to give us a bit of a talk for the first meeting. Handing over to you. Great. Thanks, Seb. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, We've had a fantastic response, so uh, thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be able to welcome you all uh, to this very first session of the Fundamentals of Orthopaedic Series. This has really come around through the hard work and dedication of a group of um, junior doctors who quite rightly have identified that although there's loads of material for higher surgical trainees, at the other end of the spectrum, when you're starting out of your career, um, there's far less. Um, and so this is all designed to give you the uh, key skills and knowledge to be able to manage orthopedic patients um, at the very beginning of your career. So SHOs, early years regs, and actually anyone, you know, in our ED colleagues dealing with orthopedic patients. Um, we've got some great sessions and in particular, there's a few really good sessions on the uh, national selection process of TNO in the UK and also some great tips and tricks on how you can uh, maximize your chances of getting uh, that elusive national training number. Uh, but for today, it's a huge privilege to be able to introduce a consultant colleague of mine from uh, the Royal London and Bo Bart's Bone and Joint Health, Mr. Peter Bates. Uh, he's a consultant orthopedic trauma and pelvic and acetabular surgeon. He's hugely passionate about trauma. He's hugely passionate about education. And you would have seen a lot of this stuff coming out of the ortho X, uh, Y, Z uh, channels. Um, I think I can think of no better person to kick us off with the principles of early trauma management. So kick back, enjoy, do get involved in the interactive content. And um, Pete, over to you and Seb, who's kindly moderating for us today. Thanks very much. Cheers, buddy. Thanks. Uh, and thank you for inviting me, guys. It's a, it's a real honour to come to uh, to be to to to, to invite, get invited to these stuff. You know, you're only good as your last talk. So, uh, you know, if you're getting invited, then it's it's great. And I, I'm, I'm thanks for having me along. Uh, my name's Peter Bates, and I'm talking about principles of early trauma management. Um, so this is a kind of a principles talk. I'm kind of overlapping with a few of the other speakers who are yet to come. So think of this as like an introduction, like a sort of like a taster. It does go on a bit. So I, this is going to go on for probably over an hour, but it, we're going to break it up with some MCQs and a bit of fun and a bit of like, you know, a bit of how's your father. So just uh, as, as Lucky says, just kick back and enjoy it. Uh, and, you know, if you have to sneak off for a cup of tea, don't worry about it. It's fine. It's fine. You won't miss anything terrible. A lot of this is basics, but a lot of it also will surprise you, will challenge you a bit, will make you think, really? But I've been told almost exactly the opposite. So I think, I hope we're going to be challenging a little bit of dogma today, but let's see how we go. All right, I'll stop boring on with that. And uh, this is my talk. So we're going to vi visit each of these blue splodges as we go, heading from over here to over there. And uh, it's going to be uh, covering, to begin with, some fairly si simple stuff right the way over to code red and pelvises over there. But before we do all of that, I just wanted to ask one fundamental question to you all. What is the point of what we do? I mean, a lot of people, a lot of like senior anesthetists have asked, what is the point of these people? These people just drive us nuts, just boring on about how they want more theater space. They all they want to do is fix freaking bones. What is the point of orthopedics? If, if orthopedics had orthopedic trauma, I'm talking about, not hip and knee replacements, but orthopedic trauma had a mission statement, what would it be? What would our mission statement be? And there are loads of answers to that. You could say, well, it's about getting the bones lined up and get, getting them healed and that kind of thing. Is it about restoring function? 
Is it about preventing stiffness and arthritis? Yeah, okay, I'm buying all of that. Those are all great answers if you're in a Viva. In the multiply injured uh, patient, uh, or in the, in the severely injured patient, it goes a bit further than that though. It's more about enabling rapid mobilization. And I think if there was one thing that, that we were, that was at our core in orthopedics, it's enabling people rapid mobilization. Now, of course, you want to get the bone straight. You don't want it like this. You want it like this. Uh, you don't want it like, like that. You want it like that. You want the shoulder back in joint, right? So there's all of that stuff. But allowing, enabling rapid mobilization is part of our core. Why? Because we know what the, fund, what the terrible consequences are of immobilization. Immobilization is a really bad thing for human beings and indeed animals in, in general, I should imagine. It's particularly awful in the elderly. They really do not like it at all. It's really bad for them. They get, uh, they get muscle wasting. They get this what's called sarcopenia, which is it's like permanent what muscle wasting. It's, it's like irreversible muscle wasting. You get normally with age, but when you, if you just sit around and do nothing for six weeks, it kind of accelerates. If you're lying in bed, you're more susceptible to all those medical problems like there and pressure sores. And also there's a big, don't underestimate for the elderly, that loss of confidence. It's, it's a big one that you don't think of it as young people, but old folk lose their confidence on their feet if you take them off their feet for long periods of time. So uh, it is a big deal for, for the elderly. Uh, it's also a big deal for young people, people of, people of, uh, you know, of, of all ages on this webinar. Uh, younger patients do not like being holed up for six, eight weeks, uh, you know, particularly if it, it, it threatens your job. Uh, you, again, you get the muscle wasting and, you know, your quads disappear, all, the, all those guns you've been working up in the gym for the last like three and a half years disappear in like, you know, disappear in a couple of weeks. Uh, if, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, and again, you get a bit of a loss of confidence, loss of income, mental illness, uh, marital breakups, family problems immobilization is a bad thing and that is what we're anti in orthopedic trauma all right so that's it that's with that mission statement in mind i'm going to take on the rest of this talk but i think you know if you, sometimes it's useful to know what you where you're coming from what's your like prime directive if you're a star trek fan i am <laughs> Uh, okay, so here's the talk. I'm starting off with fairly simple stuff, minor stuff to begin with, major stuff we'll go into later on. So we've got, we've got code reds over there, but I'm going to start off down here, orthopedic principles. I'm just going to get rid of my head for a second, because I think that's going to annoy you all if we carry on. And um, Sebastian, could you stick up the first, um, I'm going to do some, we're some, uh, some, uh, some, I shall put myself back in. Yeah, we're going to do some Q&A. So I just want you to answer these, these questions. Some of them are a bit funny, like this one. It's a ridiculous question because they're all, they're all important, particularly the last one. But I want you just to give me an idea of what you think is the most important of those things. Just kind of engage in the kind of ridiculousness of the question. What do you think is the most important? of those things. Might have a dislocated shoulder, might have like a broken arm, might have a broken ankle or something like that. Okay. Give us, give it, okay, go for it, Sebastian. What, what, what answers have we got? What have we got? Uh, yes, you will, you will have access to the, to the recording, yeah. History, I love it, I love it. What that tells me is we have a bunch of medical students on the, uh, you know, in, in the audience. I love that, because of course a history is important. Oh my God, if you've got someone who's had a heart attack, that is deeply, deeply important. Sadly though, it ain't the right answer. I, I, I get that history is important, as is, you know, getting an x-ray and stuff. But the answer is examination. Examination is the key. I think the I think the guys I think the guys who put this 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 uh, poll together actually got the, got that wrong. They they uh, it, was, it was anyway. It's supposed to be ex examination is the answer, and we'll come to that more. I, I'll, I'll explain that to you more 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 a bit. But in orthopedic in orthopedic trauma, doing a good examination is a really really fundamental thing. It's something that recurs again and again in this talk. And I just want you to hold that in your mind while we proceed. Next, next MCQ, number two, please.
How do we reduce a Collie's fracture? What's the maneuver? Remember that word reduction. Reduction means put it back where it belongs. So to reduce a Collie's fracture is to put it back in a good position. I quite like number one. That's definitely the, the first one. That's usually what I did back in the day. And what you often see back in the, in, in the emergency department, but it's not, I can tell you the top one's not the right answer. Okay. Okay, got it. Yes, it's, it, yeah, okay, got it, Sebastian. Yeah, 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 yeah. Red is the most popular. I understand. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, yeah, go for it. What, what are the answers? What are the answers? What have we got? Apply traction, dorsal manipulation, then apply molded plaster that keeps the fracture back in place. And that is absolutely what I would have said if I was at your stage. Absolutely right. Unfortunately, it's not the right answer. <laughs> anyway, excuse my delight. Let's explain. Okay, get, get, we'll lose that. Lose the pole. And on we go. All right. So let's talk about all the principles. Um, how do you treat an orthopedic injury? Fundamentally, the vast majority of orthopedic injuries, whether it's a wrist fracture or whether it's a femur fracture, they basically follow a very similar pathway. You take a history and you examine them. They then go for an x-ray. Uh, maybe a CT, but it's usually an X-ray. You then do what's called a reduction maneuver. You reduce it. Reduce means put it back where it belongs. So if it's a shoulder dislocation, you're putting it back in joint. If it's a wrist fracture, you're realigning it. If it's a femur fracture, you're again, you're realigning it. You, so after your reduction, you have to get some analgesia or sometimes some sedation for that. Um, you go on and then you've got to try and hold that reduction somehow. So you can't just reduce it and then walk out of the room or else it will tend to just fall back where it started from. So you, then you've got to stabilize. You've got to do some kind of stabilizing maneuver. And then having reduced it, stabilized, you then re-x-ray it. And then you write it all up beautifully. And sometimes they will go on to need surgery. But if you've done a good job, maybe they won't have to. I'm just going to take you over here to this, um, to this uh, Collie's fracture. Uh, let's just have a look at the... Um, Let's just have a look at the deformities that we've got going on here. So uh, you can see, uh, you can see the line of the rays. Look at that X-ray on the on the on the on your left, and what you'll see is the line of the forearm coming straight up. And I've, that, that's the that's the post reduction. But look at that one top left. Look how the the, the uh, joint is angled backwards. See that's called dorsal angulation or apex volar angulation. Yeah, do you see that? dorsal angulation and uh, if you if you look carefully on the next one across what you'll see is the radius which should be longer than the ulna is actually shorter than the ulna I'll just zoom in on that just just so, I don't know if you can see that nicely um, yeah you see that the radius is here boom and the ulna is here it should be the other way around so that's called shortening and there are many deformities you get in a collie's fracture so what have they done? They put the, look at the, look at the, at the x-ray down the bottom now, you can see they put the patient in plaster. What can you see? Compare that line up the top with this line down here. It looks like they've reduced it, doesn't it? They've reduced the fracture. They took an x-ray, they reduced the fracture, they stabilized it in a plaster, and then they got another x-ray, which is that one down the bottom, okay? And they probably had to give some some kind of analgesia or sedation or whatever they did. Maybe it's a hematoma block. Maybe it's a Beers block through a tourniquet. Maybe it was just a bit of gas and air. Maybe it was some ketamine. Maybe it was some uh, some some kind of uh, morphine derivative. But either way, they got some. They got their that sequence that we talked about earlier. Okay. So, how do you reduce a Collie's fracture? How do you do it? <coughs> just going to get rid of that for a second. So I want you to imagine this is your forearm, yeah? That's your forearm here. And I'll get this side actually. And there's my hand coming through. So this here is my wrist joint, yeah? Right there, there's my wrist joint just at the end. And I've broken my distal radius. I've broken it, but I fell out under, oh, onto my outstretched hand. And what happened was my wrist broke. It wasn't, it wasn't the actual wrist joint, it's the distal radius just below the wrist joint, okay? And now it's horribly broken like this. So now my forearm looks like that. In fact, it probably looks more like that. 
Okay. Now, you can see I've put some bits of tape. This represents the fracture right here. This is the wrist joint just here. Yeah, there's my wrist come, hand coming off the end. These pieces of tape are real things. When you, when you break a bone backwards in that direction, what it does is it snaps the bone on this side, but it leaves the soft tissues intact on this side. You may get some bits of bone on this side, like called dorsal comminution, but you get this kind of what's called a soft tissue hinge. So that is a real thing, okay? Now, I want you to think, how would I reduce this fracture? How would I put that back on? How are you gonna do it? Imagine how you would do that. You could put some traction on, right? Let's put some traction on. Let's do, oopsie, hee <laughs> Let's put some traction on. Do you see, I'm actually pulling. Look, you see the tape's ripping off. It will not go. It won't go. I can't do it. Okay, what about I give it a freaking push? And I'll pull it. So I've got Fred over here pulling, uh, and I'm going to push at the same time. What's happening? Nothing's happening. It's not reducing, is it? Why not? Because it's kind of hitched over. See that? It's kind of hitched over. What do I have to do in order to get that reduced? Weirdly, is I have to make the deformity worse. Here's how I, you all know how what I'm going to do now, don't you? I'm going to make it worse. I'm going to exaggerate the deformity. And then I'm going to push it down and then it will come down nicely and you're back on again. Yeah. So one more time, you don't just put tra traction is helpful because it takes the, it takes the muscle spasm away. Pushing is helpful because you will need that eventually. But the first maneuver after traction is to exaggerate deformity, bring, and then you can push and then you can put it on. And then you can put your plaster over the top of that. And that is how you reduce a collie's fracture, but it is also how you treat a dislocated ankle. If your ankle has been dislocated to the side, it will have a soft tissue hinge on one side, like so. And if you just push on it, it often does not go. And what you need to do instead is exaggerate the deformity slightly before you bring it over. And that's a bit of a core fundamental principle of exaggerating a deformity in order to get a fracture reduced. Okay, where do we go next? Check out the x-ray on the left. We've got a, um, we've got a femur fracture. Uh, and uh, what are we going to do? So how, let's follow that through there. Exam history examined. Yeah, we've done that. X-ray, I've got that. How are we going to reduce that? How are we going to reduce Obviously, give them analgesia. How are we going to reduce it? How are we going to stabilize it? Answer? We're going to put them in traction. We're going to put them in traction. And you can see that, that, that what they've done there. Now, is that going to absolutely perfectly line up that femur fracture? Well, no, probably it's not. It's probably not. But what it is going to do is it's going to hold the soft tissues out to length so it's tight and so it's better lined up and it's going to stabilize it because uh, when you put tension on the soft tissues, it makes the bones much more stiff. All right. So again, and then we re-x-ray and then we document and write it up. And that probably would end up with a surgery. It's going to need some kind of femoral nail or whatever to stabilize it. We'll talk about that in a few weeks time. But fundamentally, we followed that algorithm. Now, I've underlined examine. Why have I underlined that? Because before you do any orthopedic intervention, before you do any orthopedic intervention, you want to make sure you know what their neurological and their vascular status is. You want to know whether their tendons are working. You want to know whether they've got any wounds or not. You need to look at the soft tissues. Is it an open fracture perhaps? Because once you've done your manipulation, you're not going to know. And then they now have a median nerve palsy or you've reduced their, their uh, femur fracture and they've now got a foot drop, was it you that caused that during your traction maneuver or was it there to begin with? All right, so it's really, really important that before you do any of this stuff, indeed, before you give any major sedation, you do a proper examination of the patient. All right, great. So take home messages from this one are, number one, History and examination. History is important, and I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from it. History and examination is important. And of course, you've got to document those findings. But exam is the killer because that is what uh, that is the baseline examination that everything subsequently gets compared to. 
and it picks up other injuries. X-ray, yes, reduce and stabilize re-X-ray. And if you want to reduce something, often you have to exaggerate a deformity, make it worse before you make it better in order to unhitch it, take the tension off it, then reduce it, and then you can push it down. Great, all right. Next up, neurovascular, I've put down there. Can we have the next, um, can we have the next uh, number three? What you got? A patient is able to wriggle their toes and feel their foot suggests that the sciatic nerve is intact. I know that sounds like a really stupid question, but please just answer it. Answer it on, uh, just answer it. <laughs> See what you think. Okay, I'd, I'd, yeah, let's go for it. What have we got? Oh, a quote, pretty split, 59.41. False, false, I love it, I love it. Everyone knew, everyone knew that was a trick question. Even the guys who put true down knew that it was probably gonna end up being false. But, uh, but the forces have it right, and we'll explain why in a minute. Okay, next up. Number four, cold foot. Patient with a dislocated knee, which is now back in joints, is being reduced, now has a cold foot. Which of the following is true? And I won't read them out. Just so you know, an ABPI is an ankle brachial pressure index. You basically measure the blood pressure in your arms and then you measure the blood pressure in your, in your ankle and you compare the two. And if there's a significant difference between the two and you, can, you do a ratio of the two and if it's less than 0.9, in other words, if there's a 10% difference, then that it suggests you've got impaired vascularity. Okay, let's see what it is. What's the answer? All of the above are true. Okay, I love it. Great. Okay, I'm not. I'm not going to get, tell you what the answer to that is. Yeah, we'll close it up and we'll come to the next. We'll, we'll, we'll buzz through this next bit. Okay, neurovascular. Um, if you ever find, I deliberately put that term up. If you ever find yourself saying the word or particularly writing the word down, neurovascular, I'm afraid you are being a lazy doctor. And I'm sorry to say that, and I know that sounds rude, but neurovascular is a terrible, terrible term. It's something we use because we're being lazy and we don't want to document properly. So please, if you find yourself writing NV intact, and we've all done it, I've done it loads of times. So don't feel bad. You know, don't feel like you're the, you're the first person this has happened to. I used to do it all the time when I was a junior doctor, but I've come to realize that neurovascular is a terrible, terrible term. Why? Because, because that neuro and vascular are, are unrelated things. There's neurological and there is vascular and they're not the same thing. And I just wanna exemplify that. Let's go down to neurological. So this patient's had a tibial plateau fracture and they woke up with a foot drop. Now they were a little bit, uh, they, they basically came to A&E and uh, they, they, uh, they were awake to begin with, but then they had complications in relation to, their, to a head injury, uh, or sorry, in relation to, to a chest injury, and they ended up having to be intubated. So we do our operation and she wakes up for, in the intensive care unit a few days later with a foot drop. So we didn't have the chance to examine her before the immediately before the operation because she was in ITU. So we go to the ED notes and the ED notes say NV intact. Do we believe that? Probably not, but it's, it's difficult now, isn't it? Because what could be causing this foot drop? Well, it could have been injured at the time of the fracture, in which case uh, the baseline examination, the one I was just talking about, was a lazy one. It wasn't really particularly well described. It could be that she's had nerve block in theater. So you've always got to have that in the back of your mind. Has she maybe had a, had a spinal? Has she had like a big um, sciatic nerve block as part of the operation in order to control her pain? Or is this an iatrogenic injury? Every surgeon's terror. Uh, one is, one is, one is uh, infection, but the other is that you cause damage by your surgery. So surgeons get really fired up if they're worried they've caused an iatrogenic injury. 
And the truth is that if someone has written MV intact, it makes you realize that they probably didn't examine the leg properly. Um, the hand, for example, has three nerves. I know that's patronizing, but it has three nerves. So why not just document each one? Radial, median, uh, 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 and uh, radial, medial, uh, and uh, on the intact, yeah? This is the one that catches out people out there. And this is why I put the MCQ up. Sciatic has two components. I know you all know that, but let's just go through that one more time. Sciatic nerve, this is a, this is a, this is a leg, right? This is a leg, here's your foot ankle, knee, hip. Sciatic nerve comes down from the pelvis through the greater sciatic notch and it comes past the hip joint, doesn't it? And it comes down, but it quite quickly divides into common perineal and tibial divisions. The common perineal is the lateral one and the tibial is the, is the median, like the median nerve is the, is the tibial, right? And they do different things, don't they? The tibial does the flexors, does the plantar flexors, the things that make you go up and tiptoe. And the common perineal does the dorsiflexors, yeah, the ones that brings your foot up, okay? So, and the thing is the common perineal one is by far the most commonly damaged. So if you have a hip dislocation, it is very common to wake up with a foot drop. Yeah, a foot drop, you can't bring your foot up. You can push it down, and you can actually wriggle your toes because they're being flexed. You say to someone, can you, can you move your toes? So when they go, uh, 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 like that. And you push down, they go, uh, uh, uh. Okay, so the tibial division is in. But just because someone can feel the bottom of their foot and they can wriggle their toes, they can't bring them up, but they can push them down. If you're not really on it, they may have some dorsal set loss of sensation, and they may not be able to pull them up. So a lazy examiner will take, will, will feel the bottom of the foot, will say, can you wiggle your toes for me? Yes, and they'll go NV intact, all right? Don't be that doctor. Don't be that person who does that. Be the person who goes, okay, so that means your tibial division's in, intact. Let's have a look at your perineal division. Can you feel me touching on the dorsum? Can you feel me in the first web space? Can you actively dorsiflex your ankle and toes? Okay, and you can even do that like EHL. You can do that even if someone's got an ankle fracture, they can just, you just get a flicker of it or you don't have to get five out of five power. You don't have to grade it in an orthopedic injury. You just need to know it's intact, all right? And even if you don't know, maybe you just can't work out, too much pain, I won't move my ankle, it's too much pain. Just say equivocal. I, I couldn't examine them, I, I didn't know. But what you don't put is NV intact, because you don't know. NV might not be intact. All right, that's enough ranting about that. What's next? Uh, okay. And that's why the MCQ was, uh, was, was, um, was false. So the correct answer was false. Okay, next up is, I've, I've given you, so now we're into vascular, right? So vascular, so this lady who had a distal femur fracture, there you go, you can see she's got a distal femur fracture, it's what we call periprosthetic, it's above a, a knee replacement. Knee replacement is great, it's been serving her well for many years, and then she breaks above it. And she then has a CT, there you can see, the, the knee replacement is great, but she's broken the femur right above it. So what do we do for that? We want early mobilization, so what do we do? We fix it with a, a, a older patient, fall from standing height, so it's a fragility type fracture. What do we do? We treat it with a metal plate and screws. And you can see, I don't even see just uh, in the middle of that, that view, there's a, a thing, it's called a circlage wire. It's like a piece of wire that goes round the bone, uh, like all the way around it, and then grips it very, very tightly. And what that does is it, um, it, it, it helps reduce the bone. It helps bring the bone, uh, the, the fractures together, particularly the spiral configuration. So that, that's a very conventional way of treating this fracture. Reduction looks amazing, looks really good. The surgeons were high-fiving after this one, but, it was noticed in recovery that she had a bit of a white foot. Now at this point, you've done an operation and the patient has a white foot in recovery, in other words, they can't feel a pulse. So what do they do? Well, they, they think, well, this could be arterial spasm. Let's just let it settle down and see what it's like in half an hour, 40 minutes, an hour or so. They say, there might be an embolic event. It might, you know, she might have like thrown off a, an embolism or something. Uh, it might be a direct injury, it might be, as I say before, an iatrogenic injury. What could it possibly be? Um, and so at this point, 
what, what ensues, what should happen is an early referral to vascular, but what actually ensued was lots of people getting out Dopplers, people doing ABPIs. And I want to show you something. This is the angiogram that was eventually done. All right, this is a, this is a, 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 a an angiogram of the, uh, of the thing. It's just, it's just fast forwarded back to the beginning. And so I'm just gonna, uh, here we go, boy. So we're coming down. I'm just going to freeze this in a second. So we, we're, we're spanning through, we're coming down, and can you see the artery coming down? It, try and ignore the bone, try and ignore the metalwork. On the medial side, you see the artery coming down. It's, that's, it's a CT angiogram, so you're seeing that, that vessel full of, full of blood. Down it comes. Can you see where it's headed? Can you see it's headed towards that circlage wire? Now look what happens. Oik. Do you see it's been pinched right there? It's been pinched, hasn't it? By basically the circulatory wire has gone round the femoral artery and squeezed it. And obviously now the femoral artery is not running. Hang on though, keep watching. Look what happens to the femoral artery after that pinch point. Whoa, what happened? It's full of blood. Can you see that? It's full of blood. Let's go down to the tibial side. Can you see that artery going down? It's full of blood. It's got, you've got a tri, you've got three vessel runoff at the bottom of that artery. What the hell's going on? How come, how come the artery goes down and then it gets pinched right here? How can the end of the artery fill up the blood? You know the answer. It's because you have collateral flow, don't you? You have genicular arteries that, that, are, that come around the side and fill up the vessel at the bottom. So on that angiogram, the uh, the doctors were thinking, okay, well we're probably all right then. We've got some we've got some blood underneath the the pinch. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And many hours passed, and many hours passed, and they would get Dopplers out and feeling the foot, and maybe they could find a little bit of flow because a little artery had gone from the geniculus down all the way, all the way, all the way down like a tiny bit of flow, and was maybe giving a little reading in the foot. The fact of the matter is though. The main motorway of blood to the foot had been sandwiched. And therefore, it's never going to work, right? It's never going to work. And so, um, the, uh, and all this time that you're wasting getting Dopplers, getting ABPIs, getting, uh, you know, like, like trying to warm up the foot uh, to see if you can like get rid of the arterial spasm is time wasted. And what the patient needed was that angiogram followed by an urgent call to vascular. Because yes, the foot may be alive, the foot may even be sensate still, but the muscles in your calf are dying. It's the muscles actually that are, that are susceptible, most susceptible to ischemia. That's what they're the things that die in, in compartment syndrome, aren't they? It's not your foot that dies, it's the muscle that dies in a compartment syndrome. Same in a vascular injury. The muscle is the bit that dies. So my take home message here is that when you are in a situation where you have an obvious vascular injury, yeah, as in a white foot in recovery, like a knee dislocation with a, with a cold foot, like a proximal tibial fracture with a cold white foot, rather than getting Dopplers out and seeing if you can get some blood down the bottom, it doesn't matter. They've got a cold foot, They've got a high index injury. The solution is get an angiogram and then refer them to the vascular team. All right. Otherwise, all the other time you are you are just 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 wasting time while muscles are dying. So you need to rule out a vascular injury, not rule it in. If you sort of mean. Great. So avoid the term neurovascular intact. Sciatic has two divisions. You've got to comment on both of them in a lower limb injury. Doppler. ABPI, capillary return. They are all they are all techniques and they're all described. I'm not saying never ever do them. What I'm saying is don't be falsely reassured just because you can get a Doppler in the foot or you get some capillary return. Suspect a vascular injury, escalate early, particularly in, in, in injuries around the level of the knee because the vessels there, the artery there is very, the popliteal artery is very, very vulnerable. Okay. Open fractures. I'm gonna try and whistle through these. Can you put up number uh, five? I think it is. Okay. What's the most important first move? Open fracture. You usually don't score any, any points by calling the boss in this situation, if that's what you've put down. That's what Lucky's putting down. 
Okay, we're gonna hurry on, go for it. What's your answer? Examine the leg. I love it, I love it. Oh, I feel like I've succeeded and yet I've failed because it's the wrong answer. <laughs> You're absolutely right though. Uh, examining the leg is absolutely critically important here. Let's move on and I will talk you through this part of the thing. So here's an open fracture. Uh, I got this, this picture off the internet. I really like this picture. What you can see is if guy's got a broken leg, he's got a tibial fracture and it, it's a bit, it's a bit gory, but what you can see is the paramedics have chopped his trousers off, haven't they? But can you also see, look at his trousers. Can you see the hole in his trousers? Not, not where it's a hole in his trousers, it's just near the fracture where basically this broken bone went out through his trousers and quite possibly into the grass just for a millisecond, just for a second. The end of his tibia was in the ground. And then of course, what's the, what the paramedics gonna do? They're gonna straighten his leg out, aren't they? And that bit of bone is gonna pop back inside the leg and you're never gonna see it again. So when we come to treat open fractures, yes, the bone has been out through the skin, but often it's been somewhere absolutely horrible in between. There may be like bits of dirt or, or chewing gum or fingernails or whatever was hanging out by the roadside may end up on that bone end. The other thing to say about open fractures is they are incredibly distracting, and I'll come to this later. They are distracting injuries. Uh, it's it's pretty unusual to be for, uh, to be dying of these things that I'm showing you here, as bad as they look. But boy, they hold your eye when you see that. You go, "Oh my God, have you seen his freaking foot?" But actually, while that's happening, he may be quietly dying from a hemothorax. Yeah. So orthopedic injuries are often not the thing that the patient is dying of. They're the th they obviously need sorting out, but that's the thing that you're sorting out first. And that's what ATLS guides us uh, towards uh, getting right. Yeah, it, it gives us that order of stuff. And I'll talk about that a bit later on. Okay, so here are the things you've got to do when you do an open fracture and Alex Briss is to, uh, and Alexia are talking about this later on in, uh, at one of the things. And I'm not gonna go through these mu uh, uh, too much. Um, those are the things we have to do. What are the most important things? Well, the tried and tested things. I think most people would agree the one thing with the most, the most, uh, the most important thing, and it's super time sensitive, is IV antibiotics. And that was the correct answer for the IC, uh, MCQ. The BOS guidelines say we've got to give IV anti antibiotics between one hour. Basically, the sooner you give them, the better it is. And so actually with one hour, one hour after injury, not after admission. So this is driving IV antibiotics pre-hospital. So actually nowadays, the, the, pre, the paramedics and the, and the ambulance crews have IV antibiotics on, on, on their thing. Um, the other thing is really important is getting soft tissue cover. What we mean by that is you fix the fracture, but also you've got skin continuous over the top. Uh, I'm gonna skip past this a little bit because this goes into uh, uh, stuff that we're gonna deal with later on. Um, uh, and, and other things, but I wanted just to just to highlight this for you, this idea of orthoplastics, yeah? Look at the top one. Can you see that bone fracture that's been treated with a tibial nail? Can you see there's a metal rod down the middle of the bone? See that? That's the orthopedic bit. We fixed it with a metal rod. Now look at the bottom bit. This is us trying to cover up that defect with uh, some plastic surgery, taking a bit of skin from one place and moving it down to the other. That particular one is a rotational fascia, fascia cutaneous flap, but there are many different types of flap that you can use. Yeah. And that is this concept of orthoplastics to try and get a fix and flap. In other words, fix and soft tissue cover within 72 hours. Now that soft tissue cover might just be a split skin graft, but it might be a muscle flap. It might be a fascia cutaneous flap. It might be a, another kind of free flap. All right, so take a message on open fractures is early IV antibiotics for sure, early definitive cover. Those are the two kingpins of, uh, of, of, of open fracture management. Don't leave an uncovered oil, that, that will get dealt with at another time. And joint working, this is something you're gonna hear again in the open fracture section is joint working between orthopedics and plastic surgeons. Compartment syndrome, all right, all right, let's go with this then. So. Classically, compartment syndrome, and indeed vascular, is hit with the six Ps of compartment syndrome. So could you just put up uh, uh, question number six, I think it is. Compartment syndrome is best diagnosed with the following approach. What do you think, guys?
Okay, hit me. Hit me. What are, what are our answers? What have we got? High index of suspicion. I, I mean, I like that. that. That is great. It's brilliant that you put that down as, as, as a common answer because we absolutely have to have that. Uh, those who go into the six Ps, because six Ps is the classic teaching, no doubt about it. But when you look at those six Ps, how many of those are actually useful? Paresthesia is a late sign. Pulselessness, late sign. Pallor, like going white, really late sign. A cold leg, late sign. In fact, the only, if they're all, I mean, none of those are remotely useful. So the six Ps of compartment syndrome are not a helpful guide. Um, and the only really two that are, that are helpful, that are probably, you know, helpful in terms of diagnosing it are pain. Pain is the, pain is the, is the, is the biggest one of all. And, uh, and pain with passive stretch, and I'll show you that in a minute. And then of course we got the compartment pressure monitoring. So what I mean by pain with passive stretch is usually a foot, it's usually an ankle, uh, some kind of um, uh, ankle fracture or a proximal tibial fracture is the most common thing. So here's our tibia, this is our leg, right? Not an arm, here's my foot. And I've broken my proximal tibia just here, just below the knee. And we put it in plaster and it's all good. Or maybe we've even done an operation and they're, they're, they're in terrible, terrible pain. They won't move it at all. Well, I can just, I just take their, one of their toes and just bring it up. Is, does, does that make your pain worse? Now you're not like, like jacking it because that will be painful for anyone who's had a bad injury, but just the slightest on, the, uh, on one of the toes, just a little bit, will be agonizingly painful. You can do it both ways. You do dorsi and you do plantar flexion. And those obviously will stretch different compartments. But if someone's got a good going compartment syndrome and they're awake, passive stretch is the killer. They're in a lot of pain. They're gobbling up analgesics. They're, the PCA is not cutting it. And when you move their toes, they are climbing the wall. And that is, that is the examination finding. That's it. It feels tense rubbish it's cold it's it's i can't feel a pulse that isn't compartment syndrome um if in doubt or if the patient is obtunded so that or that they're, they're, they're intubated and you're worried they may have a compartment syndrome you can do compartment pressure monitoring where you put a where you put a needle into the compartment uh, and it gives you it gives you a pressure and of course we have we have guidelines for that so uh uh, a delta P, in other words, a, 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 a difference between the diastolic pressure and the actual pressure in the compartment of less than 30. In other words, in other words, uh, the, the, the compartment pressure is very, very close to being the diastolic or an absolute pressure of 40 or 50. Those are the guidelines that we have. Honestly, we often go on a trend to see what it's doing over time. But if you are diagnosing someone with acute compartment syndrome, the first thing the boss is going to ask you is, what's their compartment pressure monitor? compartment pressure. So that's, there's definitely a skill to learn. Senior review is really important. If you're at all worried, at all worried, someone might have a compartment, just ask, ask the boss, ask your immediate, immediate um, senior. And if they fob you off and go, I'm sure it's not one, but I'm sure it's not one, but just because they're being a bit lazy or they're a bit busy or they just can't really be bothered, um, you can go one, one level up again. Yeah, you might be saving this person's leg. A missed compartment syndrome is a terrible, terrible thing. Might be a stupid question, but in the patients you're assessing passive stretch, will they actively be self-splinting and not actively moving that compartment at all? Uh, yes, they will. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, yeah, they're, they're not moving their toes at all. They are, they are, they're absolutely not moving it because every time they're moving, it's agonizingly painful. But as soon as you do it passively, they are, they are climbing the walls. I'm not quite sure. Does that answer the question? I'm not sure. Um, it's worth knowing how to do a fasciotomy, even as a medical student, even as a junior, because often it's one of those, it's, it's often an on-call thing. You're on-call and it's like, oh my God, we're going for a fasciotomy. They don't happen very, ha very often. Compartment syndrome is actually pretty rare. Um, so um, so uh, it's worth knowing how to do it because if it happens and you're on-call and you know how to do it, the boss will let you do it because it's a cool operation. It's, it's, it's a little bit harder than it looks. Um, but I mean, I, I, you make two cuts, but it, it's, it's, it's not difficult when you know how to do it, uh, but it's definitely something worth looking up. So I, I would definitely encourage you all to have a go at that. And of course, same goes for forearm fasciotomies that learning how to do those, they're a bit easier actually, to be honest, but, the, but you can see the incision you're, you're supposed to make is a bit more wacky. Um, so that's that. Um, if a patient had pain with passive stretch of a compartment feels soft, 
is there still a, a suspicion of compartment syndrome? And, and this is it, Mustafa, that's a great question. But you know, but what if this and what if that? The answer is, if someone's got a lot of pain with passive stress, just call the boss. Because actually it's, it's, it can be a really difficult um, uh, diagnosis to make. And in that situation, with what you're describing, I would have gone for a, um, I, 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 would have, I would have done a pressure monitor right there and then. I've done my pressure monitoring and then I would have called the boss with the answer. I said, here's my pressure. I'm worried about passive stretch. They're in a lot of pain. Uh, can you come and review? Yeah. Can you please tell how to differentiate between partner syndrome and tibial exertion syndrome? Totally different, Ziad. Ziad, exertion syndrome is, is, is something that comes on as you're exercising and as you stop exercising, it dies off. So this is like chronic compartment syndrome. That's not something you get in acute trauma. Totally different setting. One is, is like the cold setting. Someone's, you know, someone comes into clinic and every time I go for a run, I get this really bad pain in my leg. That's not what we're talking here. Compartment syndrome happens that, that, that basically the injuries cause so much swelling that blood cannot get in or out, or particularly it can't get out. Is passive stress an absolute necessity? Uh, Nikita, maybe not. If the patient is climbing the freaking walls, then you may have the diagnosis right there in front of you. Or if your pressure, your pressures are sky high, they're like 60 or 70, the diagnosis is made. But it is a very easy thing to do and it's incredibly sensitive. You don't have to move the digits very much to get it. Okay, back to it. All right, compartment syndrome, pain and pressures, those are your main diagnostics. Delays the main morbidity, escalate early, but it's worth getting pressures. So uh, I'm almost done with this section of the thing. I just want to talk to you about practical orthopedic skills. And I, I'm, I'm going to whiz through this. So that there are lots of skills that's worth learning. It's worth learning how to aspirate a knee. It's worth, you know, aspirate a shoulder. Uh, how to do a secondary survey. How to apply a back slap. How to reduce a joint. Uh, how to, you know, put a shoulder back in a joint. How to reduce a hip joint. Uh, how to, apply, even how to put on a humeral brace. I tell you what, this guy does not have a humoral fracture. I can tell you that he's <laughs> he's he's flexing his guns, isn't he? Uh, but I, I really don't think he's got. I think he was just there. He just like a very attractive model. But uh, these are all skills that's really good to have as an orthopedic junior, uh, and you've got to go and learn those somewhere. And, you know, the classic one is the dislocated hip. How do you reduce a dislocated hip? Okay, so let's. Uh, can you put up number, I think it might be number seven, whatever the next one is. Yeah, there you go. Patient comes in with dislocated native hip. What's the most important first move? Man, if you guys get this wrong, I'm going to start screaming. I start screaming at my computer. Most important first move. Okay, let's do it. What have we got? Ah, oh, yes. Excellent. I love it. Great. Examine the patient. Absolutely right. Why? Why do we have to examine the patient? Because you're about to do something to them. Yeah, you're about to put that hip back in joint. And so you need to know right now what the sciatic nerve function in their leg is. Not just sciatic nerve, don't call it one nerve, because actually it's two, isn't it? We went through this. It's the, the two divisions of the sciatic nerve. So what is the state of the two divisions of the sciatic nerve? That's a really important bit of information to know before you start giving analgesia, before you start ringing the alarm bell uh, for theatres. Get that bit of information in, in your head. And yes, take a history. I, I'm not saying don't take histories but the examination is really important in that early stage before you start doing stuff to the patient, because this may be your last chance. Once they've had an anesthetic, once they've had a bit of sedation, they, something may happen and they are now no longer consciously able to report back their symptoms, all right? So you, in, I cannot stress to you enough, I know it sounds like I'm boring this point on again and again. When you are the doctor in ED, the orthopedic doctor in ED, you are in a powerful place. You're in a really pivotal, important place. You often feel like a bit of a lackey, like a, you know, a bit of a Jobsworth, but you are key to future decision-making. And that early examination is really important. And if you're someone who can differentiate out, differentiate out the three uh, nerves to the hand, the two 
uh, ascitic divisions to the foot, you are an incredibly useful junior ally to have. Great. Practical skills though, uh, you, you can learn them on the job, you definitely can, but you can also go and learn them at practical courses. We run one here at Bart's uh, Bone and Joint, and uh, the R one is called um, uh, Practical Orthopedics, uh, and that, that's that's coming up in October. I'm just plugging plugging our course here, uh, but there are lots of courses like this, ST three courses, just to teach you how to do these little skills, uh, which which um, which you know, it's just really nice to get your hands on and do them yourself. How to dislocate a how to relocate a shoulder, how to dislocate a shoulder. Cool. All right. So I'm going to stop there. We're going on to pelvis in a minute. Uh, it's now 9 7 52. I'm going to stop and pick up any uh, any queries or anything like that. I might have a little glug of water as well. Anything that anybody wants to talk about as part of that? Anybody? Any questions? I've got my eyes on the chat. Any questions people want to, to put out uh, in relation to that? If not, no worries. We can go. We can charge forth. How much is the course? I love it. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's thirty quid or something. It's nothing. It, it's sponsored by J and J, so it's it's a it's a nominal amount to make sure you turn up. Uh, but it, it's it's not. I, I think it's about. It's it's less than fifty pounds. Is it? I, I'm not. Someone someone on the call will, be able, will put me right in a second. But it's it's about that. It's definitely less than a hundred pounds. Uh, any courses suitable for aimed at medical students? Yes, we accept medical students on that course. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, I, I love medical students coming on. They, they, they're great. You know, we, you can you can set, have medical students in this group. Then you can have like uh, CT ones in this group. You have CT twos in this group. So you, you kind of stratify it out. So you're not having the same people, the same grade of people, kind of going through together. That's quite a nice way of doing it. Okay. Delta P, that's one of the for you to go and look up, but basically you have a pressure, right? Here's your pressure and you have a diastolic pressure, systolic, diastolic, yeah? So let's see your diastolic pressure is here. You also have a compartment pressure, which normally is like, you know, 12, nine. And so the difference between that and the diastolic pressure, let's say that's 80, yeah? But the difference between 10 and 80 is 70, right? That's your Delta P. As your compartment pressure goes up and up and up and up and up, gets closer and closer, this delta P gets smaller and smaller, yes? And therefore, as the delta P goes less than 30 or 40, then we're in alarm bell territory. Hope that makes sense. The delta P, the difference in pressure between compartment and diastolic. Uh, we've been taught, it's 80 pounds, 80 great British pounds for that course. There you go. Uh, what are the indications to exaggerate a colleague's fracture? If you want to reduce it, if you want to reduce a colleague's fracture, if you want to reduce it, yeah, you want to get that reduced, you have to, you want to do it properly, you absolutely have to exaggerate the deformity. And that involves, this is the patient, you have to, they're, they're already dorsally angulated. You have to make it a bit worse before you make it better. So we always exaggerate. You know, and you do that in theatre when you're, when you're manipulating fractures. You don't just shove them. You exaggerate the deformity and then you put it down. So it's something we do all the time. It's a real fundamental understanding, orthopedic bit of understanding. Uh, have I missed anything out here? I probably ought to crack on. Uh, we've been talking about not to exaggerate deformity in, in a colleague's fracture. Dellen, I'm so sorry, man. Uh, is there a particular reason for this taught? This is taught among orthopods. Well, whoever's been whoever's been teaching often uh, it's sold out. Oh god, let's let no one talk about that. I shouldn't have brought that up. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, um, uh, Dellen. It, it's it is a fundamental orthopedic principle. And, and sometimes you're right. Sometimes you do get taught by someone who doesn't really get it themselves. You get a lot of senior people in life who actually have some fundamental misunderstanding of what they do. Um, but I'm telling you now, if this is, if, if you, you know, try it, try it. But exaggerating deformity is a great way of reducing a fracture. Uh, only give traction, oh, we, we, we say what happens there. Uh, 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 it doesn't freaking work. I've tried it too. It doesn't work. And just pushing doesn't work either. So if you don't want to reduce it, do that. 
But if you do want to reduce it and everyone high-fiving and you get the check x-ray, it looks fucking amazing, exaggerate the deformity and put it down. Boom, I'll move on. Where are we? Okay, next up. Yes, we're going to pelvis. Okay, can you put up the next one? It's going to be a number nine, eight. Eight, is it? A pelvis is broken in two or places is by definition unstable. Mm. Feels like a trick question. Okay. Yep, play it. What's, what's the answer? True. Two place is by definition unstable. Love it. Forces. Everyone knew it was a trick question. You're not quite sure why it was a trick question, but you knew it was a trick question. So absolutely, the forces have it. Well done. Even the true guys knew that that was a trick question, yet they still couldn't bring themselves not to say true. Great. Uh, and, and the next one. Is it the next one? I think there's two here. Just put the next one up. Yes. Patient has an unstable ring, ring in, pelvic ring injury awaiting surgery. Should be kept on strict supine movement restrictions until the bone is fixed. Supine means lying flat on your back. Yeah. Oh, like spinal precautions. So basically you use spinal precautions for someone who's got a, a nasty pelvic fracture. What's the answer? True. Great. Okay, lovely. Uh, the forces have it. It's, guys, they're all trick questions, right? So whatever you think the answer is, go for the other one. That's my advice for these, these, these MCQs. Admittedly, they're really, really confusing, but I just try to make points here. Okay, pelvis. I want to deal with this thing of stable versus unstable, okay? a stable versus unstable pelvic fracture. So we have this idea that uh, the pelvis is like a polo mint. Have you ever heard that before? The pelvis is like a polo mint. Yeah, there it is. There's your pel pelvis. And it's like a polo mint in the sense that it goes all the way around, right? And they say that it's very difficult to break your pelvis in just one place. You've got to usually got to break it two places. Let's say you break it here and you break it here. You should, that's, a, that's a common configuration, a lateral compression type one, a sacral fracture, and a pute ramus fracture, or perhaps it's like a, 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 an open book type fracture. It comes open like that. So you've broken it here through the symphysis and maybe here through the sacroiliac joint. All right. So you can often break your pelvis in two places, but here's the thing. The pelvis is wrapped up in a bunch of very, very powerful ligaments. Very powerful ligaments. There's the pelvic floor. There's the sacroiliac joints lig ligaments. There's the iliolumbar ligaments. There's a, it's a whole blanket of ligaments wrapping up the pelvis. So if your pelvis is broken with a low mechanism of injury, yeah, a low mechanism of injury, um, like let's say you, 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 know, you get hit at the, at the traffic lights and it was the car hit you pretty strongly, but it didn't whack you for miles, then your pelvis may break, but the ligaments may still be intact, in which case you have a stable pelvic fracture. It's broken in two places, so the bones are properly broken, but because the ligaments are intact, it's actually stable. They're so strong, you can actually walk on it. You've got broken pelvis in two places, and yet you can walk on it. So just because your pelvis is broken does not mean it's unstable, all right? That's the first point. Second point is this, movement precautions. People, often suppose that pelvic instability is a bit like spinal instability. I mean, they're not very far away from each other. And, but the thing about spinal uh, an injury, like the one you see on the left there, is that if that patient is not uh, paraplegic, he may be paraplegic, in which case it really doesn't matter. But if he's not paraplegic, in other words, he's got some sp sparing of his spinal cord, then if you start rolling that patient around, you may uh, cause uh, neurological in injury to them actually turn uh, a, a, an incomplete uh, uh, neuro neurological deficit into a complete neurological deficit, in which case you've effectively rendered them paralyzed. So that's why we have spinal precautions. Pelvis isn't the same. It doesn't have the same, um, it doesn't have the same like nerve structures at risk. Um, uh, and uh, just one sec. Yeah. Uh, sorry, bear with me. 
Um, now, moving patients around with unstable pelvic fractures in bed is painful. And I guess that, that, that there's always this concern that if you move them too much, they might start bleeding. But uh, in reality, once a, a, a mature clot has formed around the pelvis, then actually it's very unusual for patients to start bleeding again uh, once, once that's formed. So once they're hemodynamically stable, normally uh, they are safe to be moved around. So here's my, here's my algorithm for that patient, for someone with a genuinely unstable left-sided pelvic fracture. On the right side, I'm happy them to roll to 90 degrees. They can roll, they can lie. And on the, on the injured side, I'm happy them to roll and lie to 30 degrees. So they can move around either side. Not quite so much on the left, but they can still move a bit. They can lie and they can roll to, to either side and they can sit up to 45 degrees. So I would, uh, and if, if they need traction, uh, traction is definitely helpful because as you can see there, you see that left hemipelvis is driven northwards, can't you? Uh, and so that's, that's a bad thing. So uh, my take home message with, with pelvic instability is that, sorry, with movement is that, uh, yes, you wanna be a little bit careful with pelvic, people with pelvic uh, injuries, but it's not as bad, it's not like a spine. It's not where you really do want them lying stiff and immobile. And if you are gonna roll them, you have like, you do a proper log roll. You don't really need to do that for pelvises. All right, that's pelvises. Last one, code red. Okay, this goes, this is probably the, this is the end of the talk. And I want to just, uh, and this goes on for about like 20 minutes or so. So, so I think there's what is the one more MCQ to go? I think there's one more. Ah, I love it, love it. I've already given you the answer to this, but see what you think. In the early stages of recess, a very severely mangled lower leg is one of those is an oxymoron. There's one more MCQ after this, isn't there? Okay, well, we'll try it out then. Uh, yep, let's have the answers. I love it. I love it. Both of these, that both of these was actually an oxymoron because they, those two are actually contradictory. It's often a life th threatening injury and usually a distracting fracture. Those, it would be impossible for those two to be true at the same time. So, but I'm loving that uh, people are considering this a distracting injury. That's great. Okay, nice. Last one, last thingy. Which of the fall? Oh man, there are so many double negatives in this. If anyone gets this right, I'll be amazed. But like, let's answer it anyway. Which of the following is untrue? Which of these is untrue? I'll shut up for a sec. Okay, let's go. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm fair enough. There were loads of double negatives there, uh, but it has no role in the hemodynamically normal, normal patient. And we'll come to that in just a minute. Yep, absolutely great. Lovely. So uh, the, the reds have it. The reds have it. Nice. Uh, uh, Camel's getting a bit upset about this pain thing. So this is, this is, you're getting a bit cross, aren't you? <laughs> so during examination of any patient with pain, I will not offer analgesic first, despite the patient being unable to talk due to pain, such as during MRCS OSCE exam. Would you please answer? <laughs> you put him on the, on the spot there. Absolutely. I'm not saying do not give analgesia. Of course, you can arrange some analgesia. What my, my emphasis is less about the order of things and more about uh, your emphasis on examining a patient. But yes, of course you have to give it give analgesia. And if you don't, then you're liable to fail your OSCE. So yeah, absolutely, do, do what you gotta do. But I'm telling you from the orthopedic side, the examination is core and getting it right. Not just examining them, like remember, remember to do it, but doing it well is, is the emphasis I'm trying to put over to you. But you're absolutely right. You've gotta, you've gotta like give them some analgesia. So give them some analgesia, but don't give them so much that they now like, ah, they're not completely gaga and they can't, uh, you know, they can't concentrate on what you're saying. 
Uh, one other question uh, before we go to the, uh, uh, um, can you sign post resources for examining the patient with pathology, eye assessing rotational deformity in a metacarpal or knowing that? Yeah, okay, fine. So, so again, it, it goes back to these courses. There is some stuff coming out on Ortho Hub over the course of the following year. So, we're, we're going to be trying to put this stuff together to, um, to, to, to give you that stuff. Uh, I think AAOS, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, are also putting together a similar resource. So, it's worth looking on their website. I don't know whether you have to sign up and be a member, though. It's definitely free for US residents. When I present cases on my own call to the SPR, I can suddenly ask these questions, but they're unfamiliar concepts. Thanks, really enjoying this. Great, cheers, Sebastian. Okay, here we go. Uh, code red. So this is code red. This is that. This is the hemodynamically unstable patient who's got a um, who's got a pelvic fracture, and this, of course, is a talk about shock. Okay, so talk about shock. Uh, and when we talk about shock, you've got like a little ATLS checklist of things that cause shock. Yeah. And there they are. Those are the things that kill you. And so usually that's done in the pre-hospital setting. So the anaesthetist who's, or, the, or the paramedic at the, at the scene has already been through these guys and ticked those off. And, and, and remember, these are distracting injuries. No one died of that. Okay, it may be bleeding out, in which case you can press on it, right? But it's not a thing that is going to kill you as long as you're not bleeding out, bleeding to death from it, yeah? So hugely distracting, but not the thing that's killing you, all right? So that's your ATLS checklist. And what, once you've ruled that lot out, what you're left with is hemovol hypovolemic shock. And of course, that we've got also got that list in our head of places where that could be coming from, yeah? There are five places where it could be, with pelvis being a big potential um, uh, contributor if it's injured. And that's the thing you don't want, acidosis, hypothermia, and coagulopathy. Why? Why do we care? Why do we care if they're acidotic? If they're acidotic, what that means is acidosis itself isn't great because it's metabolically disturbing. It's like it's not good for your clotting. It's not good for your heart. And it's, it's, it's generally metabolically poor. But acidosis is a sign that you are, you are not perfusing your end organs. You're not perfusing your gut. You're not perfusing your arms and legs. You're not perfusing your liver, your uh, spleen, all these organs that you should be perfusing and not perfusing. So they're now in, in, in uh, uh, anaerobic respiration. Why do, we, why do we not like hypothermia? Why is cold bad? Answer, when you're cold, you don't clot. Uh, you know, we, we have, we are, we are we're, we're full of enzymes, right? And those enzymes have an ideal temperature range to work at. And so if you're hypothermic, if you're cold, you don't clot. And if you don't clot, then you don't turn off the tap. In other words, you, you carry on bleeding, carry on bleeding, and same with coagulopathy. Great. So this is how I envisage resuscitation. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm giving you this talk because I think it's helpful for you to understand what on earth is going on in that resus bay when all of those people are gathered around a patient doing stuff and you're thinking, what the fuck is going on here? Okay, so this is to try and give you an understanding of what that's all about. Think of it as first line stuff and surgical stuff, yeah? Interventional stuff, first line and interventional. Let's start with early measures. So you first got tranexamic acid. What does tranexamic acid do? I'll come to that in a second. But it's well proven to work, and it's something that we that we that we use uh, all the time now. And uh, we've got a BOST guideline, a British Orthopaedic Association of Trauma guideline, which says that all patients require IV tranexamic as soon as possible, ideally within an hour of injury. Yes, yeah, same as all antibiotics within an hour of injury. Uh, binders. How do binders work? How do binders even work? Well, they hold the pelvis still and the clot, uh, to, so, that, so that any clot that you've already formed stays there, but they also create a pressure effect, a so-called tamponade. Tamponade is where you, where you squeeze a compartment tightly and the pressure goes up. And what that does is, so, so what, what, what is that, what kind of pressure gets, gets created? Well, they've done this. So these guys stuck like, they stuck some pressure monitors up some, some cadaver's butt. And then they put a pelvic binder on, uh, they gave them a, a pelvic fracture, and then they put a pelvic binder on. They measured with a manometer what the pressure was inside the pelvis, and it went up to about 20 millimeters of mercury. Why is that relevant? Well, what is your CVP? What's your CVP right now? Your central venous pressure, the pressure of the blood returning to your heart is 
Well, it's about, yours is probably about 15. You're sitting down, maybe it's 10 or 12. In a trauma patient, it's about one or two. It's incredibly low pressure in a trauma patient because they've lost a load of blood, they're hypovolemic. So if you can create a pressure of 20 inside the pelvis, that will have the effect of turning off pelvic bleeding. Yeah? And so a pelvic venous bleeding. So any bleeding that's left tends to be arterial. Okay, so that's that's why we think binders work. They they hold the pelvis still and, and they exceed CVP. Next up, massive transfusion protocols. This was a real revelation. These have been around about 10 years now. Uh, and uh, we got these from the, the, the conflicts in Afghanistan and in, uh, in, in Iraq, where basically people were being killed, uh, people being shot and wounded and they're bleeding out very fast. And we worked out that instead of giving people normal saline, you give them blood products. You give them what's called a, a whole blood equivalent. And let's have a look at that. So it's often split to pack A and pack B, and everyone has a slightly different, different protocol. But here we go. What are red cells? You know what red cells are. They carry oxygen, right? They're not even particularly good at that because they're depleted in 2,3 DPG. That's the stuff that allows them to take on and release oxygen uh, and CO2. Uh, FFP. Uh, F, what's FFP good for? FFP has clotting factors. That's all it is, just clotting factors. What, what are platelets? Uh, platelets, they're, they're the things that get trapped in the fibrin clot, aren't they? They're the things that they, 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 they circulate around. And in the clotting cascade, they get stuck in the fibrin clot, and then, and then there's your clot. Um, what's cryo? What the hell is cryoprecipitate? Cryoprecipitate is fibrinogen. So remember, remember, your, uh, remember your clotting cascade, it'll be fresh in the memory of all most of you guys, your, your cl clotting cascade comes down like a Y, doesn't it? You've got the extrinsic and the intrinsic, and then they come down to a common pathway at the bottom. And then right at the bottom, right at the bottom, you've got fibrinogen goes to fibrin. And fibrin is the clot. That is the, the clot. That's what the platelets get trapped in. So you've got no fibrinogen, you're going to get any fibrin, you're not going to get no clot. Doesn't matter how many clotting factors you've got, doesn't matter how many red cells you've got, You've got to have fibrinogen. So if that gets depleted, then that's a problem. All right. So that's a massive transfusion protocol. In other words, instead of giving people saline, we give them a whole blood equivalent. And if we don't know their blood group yet, they get group. Uh, they get uh, they get O negative blood, uh, O positive in men. Uh, oops, sorry. So. What does that give you? It gives you oxygen carriage and it gives you the ability to clot. Remember, those fluids have to be warmed. If you put them in cold straight from the fridge, they won't work. Why not? Because cold blood, uh, you know, the enzymes just don't work and therefore uh, that fibrinogen will not turn to fibrin. It has to be warmed up in order to work. It's got to be body temperature. Okay, there's this other thing called permissive hypotension, which we do, which I, I wasn't going to dwell on too much, but basically that means not raising their blood pressure too much. You leave it reasonably low with a, a systolic of 90 so that they don't, you don't blow off any clot. It, it, they, they form a clot when they're hypotensive. You want that clot to become mature and solid. So if you rack up their blood pressure to 120 over 80, you might blow that off. It's not called permissive hypertension anymore. It's called damage control resuscitation. But the fact of the matter is you can't, you don't want to be continuing on that for too long. So it can't go on forever, but it's a good way of getting control of a patient and allowing, allowing some clot to form in, in the short term. So there is, those are the first things that happen. Often, often there, there it is right there, a binder, tranexamic, transfusion protocol, control their blood pressure, don't jack it up too high and keep them warm. That is the staple. If anyone asks you, how do you resuscitate, resuscitate your patient? Boom, that is it. Five things, five cornerstones of resuscitation. And that's called damage control or hemostatic resuscitation. I'm just going to talk to you briefly about issues with binders. Uh, I might. I will try and flip through this quickly because uh, I, don't, I don't want to drag you past the hour and a half mark. Uh, mark but basically with binders, uh, uh, I. OK, I will, I'll run with this. Um, Look at that x-ray at the bottom, what you get with those two x-rays. You can see the, the patient, it's the same patient, but what happened was they came in after a big injury and then a few days later, it turned out that their pelvis, once the binder had been taken off, their pelvis opened up. 
and this was a missed APC injury, a missed open book fracture, yeah? Because the binder had closed up the book and it's well documented now, there's plenty of evidence now that shows that uh, uh, pelvic binders can obscure uh, open sacroiliac joints, they can obscure, obscure uh, symphyseal disruptions like this. So what do we do? What's the solution to that? Is an x-ray out of binder. So if you have a patient with a high energy mechanism of injury, they need to get an x-ray out of binder once they're hemodynamically stable. All right? And that's in the pelvic guideline, uh, pelvic post guideline. Uh, all polytrice trauma special require post binder x-ray after resus, even in the presence of a negative CT. So the CT is not the thing that you've gone because the, the, the CT has a gantry, like, you know, the, the dish, it's got a slightly dished and that can close your pelvis up. Okay, next up is soft tissue compromise. And you know, if you leave binders on too long, they, they can cause blisters. So we try and get them off within 24 hours. And that's also in the post guideline. Ideally, it should be removed within 24 hours of injury. Next up, over squeezing the pelvis, over compression. Well, you can see this is a, you know, if you put the, the, the binders on too strongly, um, then, then uh, you can obviously over reduce the pelvis has been happened here. Uh, uh, but uh, most of the binders nowadays have a little clicker on them so that, that you, you pull you pull the thing and it goes click and that's the right uh, you know that's the right uh, tension for them and then you can put them down and that helps to, to alleviate that so binders are okay for all fracture types they're hemodynamic devices not orthopedic ones in other words once the patient is hemodynamically stable binders can be taken off doesn't matter what the pelvic ring injury is. They're not there to make your x-ray look nice. They're there to stop bleeding. If the patient's not bleeding, that goes back to our MCQ question. If the patient is not bleeding, they don't, the binder does not need to be on. Okay, great. Lastly, and this is a big one, guys. This is a big one, is binders cover stuff up. We are out of sight, out of mind creatures. And so when there's a binder on, like that patient on the left, you just think, oh, well, binders on, that bit sorted. And when you're doing a secondary survey, you're looking around the patient, but you're probably not looking between their legs because it's hard to get to. Uh, but there might be a little hole hiding under his scrotum or in the perineum or even in the vagina, which is hiding from you. And if you don't look for it, you won't find it. So when you're doing your secondary or tertiary survey, you must examine the perineum. And if you're the person taking a binder off, or a patient a binding gets taken off while you're there, you've got to go back into secondary survey mode and think, right, have they got a perineal injury? And you've got to have a look, lift up that ball bag and have a look. Great. And of course, there are there are some times where, you know, for example, you've got a big, a big groin wound like this one, where, you know, a, a binder just isn't going to cut it. Yeah, there's this another another patient. These are very, very severely injured patients. And patients with big wounds over their groins cannot, uh, you know, binders just don't work. You know, they're going to have to come off at some stage. OK, so binders, because everyone asks loads of questions about binders. That's why I've gone a bit hard on these. Put them on as early as possible in the pre-hospital setting. And, that, and, 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 and you know where binders sit, that the binders should sit at the level of the greater trochanter. Remove them when hemodynamically stable, clotting is normalized, and then you can re-X-ray them out of binder, yeah? Examine underneath them. That's a really important thing, really important. Open wounds, you need some kind of alternative. Great, that's binders. So now, in the last like five minutes or so of this talk, I'm gonna talk about information gathering. Uh, that what information you get, you get temperature, you get lactate, you get about clotting, there's all sorts of things you can get. And lactate is useful, but if it's less than two, then we're, we're probably winning. That's, uh, lactate is a reflection of your acidosis, you see. So if you're less than two, that's great. If you're more than four, they're still very acidotic and you need to keep going. Uh, this is a funny thing, a rotem. So a rotem is a, um, is a device for measuring your clotting. I think actually I might zoom on from this, but it, it, it's a way of measuring clotting as part of uh, the resus, resus process. Um, this guy here, there are two things in this, in this image I want you to look at. At the top is the CT. Nowadays we have CTs in, in resus bays and so, and so you can get in and out of CT very quickly. The thing on the right that looks, looks a bit like a drip stand is actually a thing called a level one infuser. And what it does is it takes all those blood products like your FFP and your red cells and it mixes them up in that buckety type thing. And then it goes and then it goes into the main machine. And what the machine does 
is it mixes them together, but it warms them up. It warms them up and in warming them up and, and then it can deliver them at very, very high rate. So even if you're massively bleeding to death, the level one infuser can get you in and out of the CT very quick, you know, can, can get you in and out of the CT safely because it can replace blood almost as quickly as you can lose it. Even if you've been stabbed in the heart, it can almost, or maybe not, not that's an extreme example, but uh, you know, in blunt trauma, a level one infuser can keep you alive while we do the other, other bits and bobs that are required. I'm gonna zip past this section and get to the end. So, I talked about first line interventions at the top, and then I'll talk about surgical interventions at the bottom. Remember what we said about venous bleeding at the, top, at, at the beginning? If you've got a binder on, uh, that will stop, help stop the venous bleeding, particularly if you sort out their clotting. So usually, and we know that around 80, even 90% of pelvic bleeding from trauma is venous in origin, not arterial. So if you do all those things really, really well, venous bleeding will be stopped. And so patient normalizes and it's very unusual to have to go to surgical or interventional things. But if you do have an arterial bleeder, a proper arterial bleeder that is just pumping away, then despite doing all of that, you will still be unstable. And those are the guys who need some kind of intervention. And there are two types of intervention. One is angiographic embolization and one is pelvic packing. And it's very, very, uh, 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 so, you know, institutional culture is, it, it varies between centers, which of those people prefer. At the Royal London, we do a lot of angiographic embolization, but we also do pelvic packing. Uh, but there's a lot of surgeon preference that goes on. Embolization is where the patient does, the, does down to the interventional radiology suite and they, uh, and, and they put a, a guide wire up into their aorta and down the other side, and they pour gel foam or a coil, or sometimes even a stent into the bleeding vessel. And that could be selective uh, or it could be non-selective. Selective is whether you're doing an end artery like the superior gluteal in this case, or non-selective where you're just doing the internal iliac. Uh, and it does work, but people worry about you know, what, what the impact is of, uh, of embolizing someone, of like you know, turning off someone's internal iliac. So selective versus non-selective, people prefer non-selective if possible, but sometimes, you know, you can't do that. And that's, again, that's in the BOST guidelines. Finally, pelvic packing, what is that? Well, it's basically stuffing packs inside the pelvis like this. And uh, uh, you can see here, it, it's, it's, it's not in that peristeria, it's not in that blue bag. It's, it's it, it, the bottom of the blue bag. You see where the, ca the, the, uh, the catheter is there? Uh, it's in that bit where it says pre-peristeneal fat. That's where pelvic bleeding happens and it expands upwards. So if you look in this thing, that's the, that's the peristeneum there. This is a, a cadaveric patient. You can see all their guts lying in the, in the middle. Yeah, so that's their peristeneum, that's where the guts are. But look what happens if you pull that down, you go just in front of that, you can see the tenting that you put your hand into it and you can see um, it opens up into a massive space. Uh, you fit a baby in it. And, and of course you can bleed to death in it. So when you put someone, when you've put pelvic packing in to stop bleeding, it looks a bit like this. You can see those packs, those little white kind of like, like, like sort of a, white speckledy bits those are packs with little metal ray tech in them so they show up on x-ray and those have been stuffed into the pelvis really strongly and i'm going to carry on and leave that out okay so those are the two equivalents one is pelvic packing one is angiographic embolization how do you decide between the two well um, you've done your first line stuff, your resuscitation, you put your binder on, you put your traction on, you've resuscitated aggressively, you've given your massive transfusion protocol, all that, all that good stuff. Some patients will have other things going on. They will, uh, you know, they'll have, they'll, uh, they, they, maybe they've got bleeding in the abdomen, maybe they've got bleeding in the brain, maybe they've got an ischemic limb, something else is going on, which is forcing you to the operating theatre, in which case, if you're going to theatre anyway, why not do packing uh, at the same time, pelvic packing, because that needs to happen in the operating theatre. If there isn't any of those other things going on, uh, another reason that uh, they, they don't they don't urgently have to go to theatre uh, for one of those other things. 
and also, of course, angio is available in your institution, then you can go for angio embolization. Of course, if you've done one, you can go, if you've embolized, you can then go and pack them if they're still bleeding. Similarly, if you've packed them and they're still bleeding, you go to angio. So, uh, and that's a conceptual diagram of how you decide between packing and angio. And contrast CT tells you whether you've got an active bleeder. Remember when we have CT scans, it's not just a CT anymore, it's a contrast CT, so that will show any arterial bleeding, and sometimes it shows you some venous bleeding as well. Brilliant. All right, so that is my, uh, that is my talk. Uh, are there any further questions? Do binders come in different sizes or is it standard size that adapts to the patient's body habitus? Yeah, it's exactly that. They're, they're, all, they're all one size. So you don't have like small, medium, large. They've just got this one binder with a very long strap. So in very fat patients, uh, you know, that the strap has to reach right the way over the front and can be slightly unsatisfactory. You don't have to use a binder. You can just use a sheet. Sheet as, is, is, you know, you take a sheet, you pull it together, you know, and then you can wrap it in a knot and clamp it or you can tie a knot in it, whatever. Any other questions? Looks like not. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bates. That was a fantastic talk, as always. Um, I'm sure everyone is going to agree. They're also looking forward to uh, another one of your talks later in this series. Um, so just checking, there's no other questions from the audience today. Anything at all? Anything at all? Any questions? Roll up, roll up. Last, last opportunity. <laughs> Outstanding. So, I mean, uh, thank you very, uh, very much, Mr. Bates. That was a really good talk tonight. Great. Um, while we're here, I'd just also like to thank our sponsors from LEADER, as well as the support from the Royal College, um, especially to our team as well, Mr. Jay Seelan, who's the chair for this series, and also Charmley, whose idea actually this all came from. Um, and also, thank you very much for everyone who's attended tonight. It's been a really great turnout. So thank you for coming along and uh, supporting this course. Now, uh, I'm just going to bring up the feedback. Um, if everyone can just, um, on the screen at the moment is the link for the feedback. Uh, please, if you can complete it immediately, because this will allow us to monitor attendance. In order to get a certificate for this course, you'll need to have attended at least five of these courses or more. Um, Regarding the recording, I think a few people have already asked. Um, the recording for this session will come up on the below website, theoperatingnetwork.com in the next few days. Um, subsequent sessions will come up um, later on down the line, not necessarily immediately after the sessions. Um, also to mention before you'll go, you're also gonna give a shout out to BOTA, which is the British Orthopedic and Trauma Association. They are running their annual Congress online and that will be happening uh, soon it's going to be happening on the 7th of July, I believe, but you can get more information on their website, which is bota.org.uk. Um, please join us next week, uh, Wednesday, 7pm again. Um, we're going to have a talk on orthopedic infections from a joint team with both, with both orthopedics and plastics team. Um, so that will be Mr. Riss, Mr. Iliadis and Ms. Citron. Um, and I believe that's about it. So thank you very much. Please complete the feedback and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Cheers, guys.